Hey, good evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz coming to you from Los Angeles. And here's some of the stories we're watching tonight. It's very unexpected. Like, it really happened out of the blue. He's talking about the blanket of smoke covering New York and other parts of the East Coast, all coming from the wildfires burning in Canada. Now, we've got answers to the questions that so many people are asking right now. How bad is this for your health, and when will it all end? Also, another day, another Republican candidate makes their run for the White House official. I know we can bring this country back, but it'll require new leadership. And speaking of Washington, we're going to sit down with a former car salesman turned congressman who's now working to get his master's degree to better understand AI. And if you're living on the East Coast, chances are you are seeing a post-apocalyptic looking sky that almost seems straight out of Blade Runner. And you, you might be breathing in the same particles that are turning that air a hazy red. So as of right now, the last check, the air quality in parts of New York and Pennsylvania are ranked the worst in the world. And that's because of those intense wildfires in Canada. Fire officials are fighting more than 400 fires right now, and at least 200 are out of control. All that smoke is making its way down to the United States with a handful of states shrouded in hazy sepia skies. And that is what New York City's George Washington Bridge looked like this afternoon. All told, about 75 million people are dealing with dangerous air quality warnings. That's like uh, one in three Americans. And it has schools canceling class, some companies like Google telling employees to work from home. At one point, the FAA grounded all planes headed to New York's LaGuardia Airport because of the va bad visibility that you're seeing right that now. It's been lifted, but the FAA says they are still slowing traffic to a few areas airports and both the New York Yankees and the Philadelphia Phillies have canceled games tonight because of that severe uh, haze. Our team is standing by to bring you this story from every angle this hour. NBC's Emily Akeda starts us off from Hoboken, New Jersey. Emily? This is what we mean when we say smoke smothering cityscapes. It's pictures that you out west are quite familiar with, with the number of wildfires you experience in California. Typically, I'll tell you, what you should be able to see just right about here is the Empire State Building. North of me, I typically would be able to make out the George Washington Bridge, but just the complete skyline of New York City obscured, including the most iconic silhouettes. And for the second day in a row, New York City has recorded some of the worst quality air in the entire world. Governor, New York Governor Kathy Hochul really putting things into perspective recently describing the AQI, the air quality index. She says that typically the state of New York sees the index around 50. Well, we have seen that number exceed 400. That means we are in hazardous territories. And that is why you will see so many people like me wearing masks like this, taking these kinds of precautions because the onset of symptoms from this degree of poor air quality, they will come quickly. Watery eyes, scratchy throat, coughing, fatigue, headache, in some cases, even difficulty breathing, especially for those more vulnerable populations. Medical experts pointing out young children whose lungs haven't yet developed, also seniors, people with pre-existing conditions, uh, especially respiratory conditions, and then also expecting mothers. We spoke with one pregnant woman who says she is staying inside all day today as a precaution. Take a listen here. I'm not going anywhere. I was supposed to teach in Manhattan, um, you know, which involves a lot of walking around, waiting for the train, maybe waiting for a bus. Um, and it just didn't seem worth it today. And we know this smoke is being funneled from those Canadian wildfires. There are more than 400 blazes active right now in Canada, in our northern neighbor. More than 200 of them are considered out of control. We know the U.S. Forest Service has U.S. personnel on the ground. They're contributing to the firefight as we continue to see these conditions linger and travel hundreds of miles from their origin. Gotti? Wow, those time lapses are incredible. Emily, thank you. Meanwhile, the terrible air quality is sparking some serious health concerns. NBC News medical fellow Dr. Akshay Sal joins us now. Uh, Dr. Sal, I, I want to show you something which has been freaking out a lot of our producers during today's meeting. Uh, the World Air Quality Index. It has a website where you can check the air quality in your area real time. We checked it before the show. So much of our team is in New York. 7 p.m. in New York City, it was 247. If you look a little bit closer there, uh, it, it literally has an image of someone in a gas mask. Uh, can you help us understand this? How bad is it out there? Are, are masks enough? 
Yeah, it's it's bad, Gotti. I mean, to give some context, that number that you saw, 249, you want that number really below 50, ideally. So it's it's much higher than it should be. And yeah, there was some there was some sort of uh, concern initially from from people on your side of the country, really the West Coast, that is this just typical wildfire smoke? Are we overreacting? But I think as the data has sort of come in here, um, we're seeing this is one of the worst air quality days on record. And so there are some real health impacts. Um, the good news, Gotti, for healthy people, this should hopefully be just a sort of irritation, like you talked about. Uh, with a little eye irritation or nose or throat, but really who we're looking for, are, 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 who we're concerned for are pregnant patients and older patients and those with weak immune systems, that the smoke could do more damage, especially should it stick around a little bit longer. I know Emily mentioned young children and the elderly, and of course pregnant as well. Um, what happens to the body when you're surrounded by this type of particulate? Yeah, so this, this particulate, really, really fine particulate that can actually go into the nose, and then because it gets into your body, it can get into your bloodstream and cause a little bit of inflammation. Um, and so just on that note, the, the best thing really to do here is to bring out one of these bad boys, uh, these KN95s that we're so used to seeing over the last few years. Bring them back. Um, they are the kind of mask you want to wear when you're talking about that really fine particulate matter. Um, but what can it cause? You know, besides irritation, with pregnant patients, it can even lead to premature birth. Um, it can lead to the higher risk of, of heart attack and stroke. Um, so it's definitely something we want to take seriously. And it's, you know, the best advice, really stay inside. If you don't have to go outside, don't go outside. There are plenty of TV shows and movies. You can stay inside. You can binge some shows on Netflix. It really is that important that if you don't need to leave the house, Scotty, you don't. And uh, just another reason to keep those N95s around. Dr. Sayal, thanks so much. Anytime. So how long is this going to last, and, and what are the next few days going to look like for our friends on the East Coast? Let's bring in NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens. Uh, Bill, uh, first off, i got to say, this is a weird year. We're watching this from L.A., and we're thinking, okay, we have had blizzards, we have had tornadoes this year, and now New York is dealing with uh, what looks like what we normally see during fire season. Uh, how long could the haze last out there? Uh, longer than everyone would like. I mean, this is kind of day two of like, okay, what's going on? This isn't normal. And it looks like tomorrow is going to be similar, but a little better in the New York City area. And then finally Friday, we start to see it where we'll actually see the sun again and probably a little haze, not to the weekend, though, completely gone. So let's kind of show you where we're at right now, because this isn't just like, oh, wow, there's some smoke coming down from Canada. Obviously, we have all the health concerns, but just so many millions of people being affected by this. We started this morning with this huge, dense area of thick smoke right over central New York, especially the Syracuse region. That moves southwards into New York City. Those are the amazing time last pi pictures you saw. That was right around 3 o'clock this afternoon. And that's now moved down to about Philadelphia. Allentown, Pennsylvania has some of the worst air quality in the entire world right now. If you follow the air quality index, they're in the mid 4 100s, like 460, which is like you know, New York City right now is around 300. So just to give you an idea of how bad it is. And so tomorrow, as we go throughout this forecast, we'll see this area dispersing a little bit, but it's going to spread south. Watch out around Baltimore, Washington, D.C., some Boston. We could sneak some up into areas of southern New England. And then we're going to see the smoke plume going all the way back into areas like Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Detroit, areas that haven't had it horrible yet. You're going to see some of the worst smoke in the days ahead. And again, not till Saturday are we going to completely get rid of this smoggy mess. And it, this morning, it was as far south to Charlotte, North Carolina. This is not just a New York City thing. Wow. Big question here. How much of this is because of, of climate change? Yeah, uh, that's a tough one. We have to get the research into it, you know, post afterwards to see how much it added to it. But we do know that Canada, especially Western Canada, just finished one of its warmest springs ever. And then they had this string of thunderstorms, also mixed with a couple areas of arson, too, that has caused this just huge amount of fires across Canada, which is about six times what they normally would be this time of year. And it's just weird because, God, as you know, in the West, it's been kind of cool. We got some rain in the mountains. This has been one of the slowest starts to fire season in the West that we've ever had. But in Canada, it's completely the opposite. So I like to say it like this. We would still have these fires if it wasn't for climate change, but they are worse because of it. Another thing that comes to mind when you start to see that smoke is, uh, does this mean that you're going to see fires pop up a lot closer to home? Is there a fire risk in, in the East right now and in the United States? 
Uh, yesterday, there was a chance with uh, what we call dry based thunderstorms, which are actually really rare for the east, but a lot of people in the west have heard of them. It's when you get a thunderstorm, it doesn't have a lot of rain with it, but it has lightning. Those are the ones that can cause fires. We're in a little bit of a flash drought right now from about the Ohio Valley into New England. If that continues into the summer, yes, we could see more wildfires closer to why I'm here in the New York City area or on the east coast. But as of now, Gotti, it's very quiet across the lower 48 as far as wildfires go. Uh, Obviously, everyone, including you in the West, would like to keep it that way. Bill Cairns, thanks so much. I got to say, man, thank you for being out there. I know that usually you're in the studio stuck there when it's sunny outside. And then, you know, <laughs> we have bad air quality. You get stuck outside. Not I fair mean, at I, all, I, but I, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be wearing this mask either, but I don't want to breathe this air in. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I hope you keep it on, Bill. Thanks so much. Next time it's very sunny, hopefully we'll, we'll have you outside. All right. Thanks, Johnny. And turning now to Rome, where Pope Francis has uh, just come out of surgery. The Vatican says he underwent a three-hour hernia surgery a little earlier, and he's recovering. Now, this is the latest health complication that the Pope is facing. Remember, he was hospitalized with bronchitis in April. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Lavanga has more from Rome. The doctor who performed the surgery told journalists later in the evening here at the Gemelli Hospital that the surgery went well, that the Pope is vigil uh, awake and that he's already back uh, at work, he said, and that he tolerated well both uh, the surgery and the general anesthesia. He explained that the uh, Pope has been suffering from a persistent uh, pain that was caused by some intestinal blockage caused by uh, a hernia that formed on a scar from a previous uh, surgery uh, going back to the times when he was still uh, in Argentina. Uh, he said that this was not a, an emergency surgery, uh, that this was a scheduled surgery uh, that in agreement with Pope Francis they decided to undertake today uh, to get rid of that problem and ease uh, the Pope from that pain. He said also that usually patients who undergo this type of surgery are expected to stay in hospital five to seven days, even though the Pope's uh, spokesperson, Matteo Bruno, already said that all audiences with Pope Francis have already been cancelled at least until June the 18th. But perhaps the best indication that the surgery really went well is the fact that, at least according to the doctor, Pope Francis has not lost his sense of humor. Uh, the doctor said that as soon as the Pope woke up from uh, his general anesthesia, since this was the second uh, surgery that this doctor performed on Pope Francis for the past, in the past few years, uh, well, the Pope asked the doctor, when are we having the third surgery? <laughs> Claudia Lavanga, thanks so much. And in London today, Prince Harry was back in court wrapping up his testimony against the publisher of a British tabloid. He says the outlet's reporters unlawfully snooped into his life and accuses him of hacking into his phone in an organized scheme. But the Duke of Sussex appears to have little evidence to back up the claims. NBC's Josh Letterman has more. Prince Harry wrapping up his time in court after two grueling days of cross-examination, both by lawyers for the Mirror newspaper group and by his own attorneys. Prince Harry recounting in vivid detail many of the difficult moments uh, that he says were reported on by these tabloid newspapers, including the Mirror, based on allegedly hacked information from his voicemails, including stories about the death of his mother, as well as stories about failed relationships that he had in the past that he blamed in part on uh, the very uh, invasive reporting by these newspapers. And a major argument that defense lawyers from the newspaper made was that Harry can't actually prove that any of those stories were based on illegally obtained information, alleging that basically what Harry is saying here is just speculation. In fact, the lawyer for the Mirror pointed out that of the 33 articles that were picked apart during this court case, in none of them can Prince Harry point to a specific voicemail that he believes led to uh, the reports that were then generated. But Prince Harry is saying, look, this is part of widespread hacking that he believes started when he was uh, a teenager. He says he can't pick and choose and point out specific incidents, but that he believes there was industrial-scale cover 
cover-up attempts to destroy uh, evidence and that it's actually up to the defense lawyers to ask the reporters for this newspaper group where the information came from. There was also an emotional moment in the final minutes of the cross-examination where Prince Harry was asked what it's been like to testify for the last few days, how he feels. He had a long pause, appeared to choke up a bit before saying it has been a lot. The case now continues with additional witness testimony. They'll be closing arguments over the next coming weeks before this goes to the judge for a ruling, which isn't expected until later this year. Josh Letterman, thanks so much. And there is still a whole lot of news to get to this hour, like the eruption of one of the world's most active volcanoes. We're talking about the same one in Hawaii that destroyed hundreds of homes back in 2018. That story is just ahead. Hey, welcome back. And here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Hollywood actor Jay Johnson, who was on shows like Arrested Development and Bob's Burgers, has been arrested in California. He's facing charges in connection to the January 6th Capitol riot, including felony. And Florida Governor Ron DeSantis made his way to the southern border. His first visit there as a presidential candidate, he met with border officials in Arizona, all while directly attacking President Biden's immigration policies. Now, the visit is coming as Florida is once again under fire for arranging flights for migrants to fly to Sacramento, California. And authorities have now identified the victims of last night's deadly shooting at a high school graduation in Virginia. An 18-year-old who had just graduated and his father were killed. Five other people were hurt, and the suspect is now in custody. And CNN is once again in the news after the company announced today that Chris Lick is no longer the CEO. He took over the company in February of 2022 after the abrupt resignation of Jeff Zucker. The company will be led by an interim leadership team in the meantime. An actor and rapper Tupac Shakur got his own Hollywood Walk of Fame star today. The star is at 6212 Hollywood Boulevard, and it was accepted by Shakur's sister. Tupac was shot in 1996 in Vegas, and his murder has never been solved. Now, the East Coast might be covered in a hazardous smog, but on Hawaii's big island, the Kilauea volcano began erupting early this morning for the second time this year. Now, this is the second largest volcano in the state and one of the most active volcanoes in the entire world. The lava flow is currently confined to the, the surrounding crater floor. So as of right now, public officials saying this is not a threat to locals. But NBC's Dana Griffin joins us now to give us an update. So the Hawaiian Emergency Management Agency tweeted this morning uh, that the glow of the the lava was detected at 4.44 mm -hmm. uh, in the morning, uh, but there was also an indication before that this volcano could erupt. That got a lot of people very worried, right? Well, here's the thing. They say that scientists have actually been monitoring seismic activity here for weeks, and so they said that there was like a series of earthquakes that lasted for hours, and that's when they started seeing the magma rise to the top, and that's what prompted them to change that volcano alert level from orange to red. But they say the good thing is there's no threat to the public at this point. There is a concern, though, for ash, uh, which could be kind of toxic. It can cause breathing problems or worsen them. And it can also cause eye irritation. It, it, on the Big Island, as soon as the ground starts to shake, people immediately look to the volcano. Yeah. Uh, this is confined to the crater right now. So this is yes. very different than what we saw in 2018, right? Exactly. And that's what they want to make. That's a big point that they're trying to make here is that although we are seeing this eruption, it's not like the 2018 one where, you know, that destroyed 700 homes. And just a little bit of history about this particular volcano, there have been 61 separate eruptions since 1823. And that 2018 was the largest that they had experienced in centuries. So I'm sure that gives people a little sigh of relief. But again, it is concerning because officials are going to be monitoring this. But even the mayor of Hawaii said, hey, this may actually bring more people to the Big Island. They're actually um, planning to have an influx of people, possibly buying up plane tickets from those smaller islands trying to get there because wow. this is kind of like a once in a lifetime experience for people. Even one of the local reporters there said that he had never seen something like this in the last five years of covering the volcanoes. He said when he was at a close enough distance to see it, it sounded like a jet engine and he could feel the ground rumbling. And I don't know, I know yeah. you spent time there before. Well, it, was, it was there in 2018 and I remember you could feel the ground shake. Mm -hmm. It was also, we've spent some time in the ocean where yeah. you know, 
these lava bombs that were hitting the ocean. It was terrifying. Wow. And, uh, and you, you can never forget the smell. But I, I do say, uh, back in 2018, like, it's interesting to hear you say that about tourism and maybe there'll be an influx of people because mm -hmm. at that time, it was such a slow-moving disaster. Yeah. And people were staying away from the entire state of Hawaii because they thought what was happening on the big island was mm -hmm. happening everywhere. And it, it, now the opposite is true? Is it's that the opposite. Yeah, they think that they're kind of calling this like a spectacular opportunity <laughs> for people. So they think that this is going to draw people to that national park just so that, they, so, that, so that they can watch the volcano and kind of take in the sight. It is one of the most incredible places in the United States. So yeah. hopefully people enjoy it from a, a safe distance and things stay <sighs> exactly. in the crater. Maybe they need to wear a mask, just like people are now in the Northeast because, you know, don't want to play with those type of gases. Absolutely. Dana, thanks so much. No problem. And now to Glendale, California, where violence broke out outside a school board meeting as protesters clashed with LGBTQ advocates over school curriculum. Miguel Almaguer has the details. The melee between protesters and LGBTQ advocates erupted as tempers flared. Steps outside the Glendale Unified School District board meeting. If you do not disperse, you will be arrested. As police near Los Angeles declared an unlawful assembly, arresting those who became violent, inside district leaders were forced to take a recess. We are going to need to pause for a moment. The board met to approve a resolution recognizing Pride Month as it's done for years. Officials saying intentional and harmful disinformation has been circulating about what is being taught in our district. Parents want transparency and then parents want the uh, option to opt out. I think the curriculum is fairly well designed. I know the teachers put a lot of work into it. This week's skirmish, which California's governor called an organized campaign of hate, is just the latest in a series of violent confrontations during Pride Month. Just days ago, protesters clashed outside an L.A. elementary school where a pride flag was burned. This week, the human rights campaign declared a state of emergency for the LGBTQ community, sounding the alarm over the current political climate and culture wars. Tragically, this has come to our district, but we're really seeing this all over the place. Tonight, a month of celebration turning into days of confrontations. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. And coming up, the man suspected in the disappearance of Natalie Holloway is set to be extradited to the United States. We're on the ground in Peru with those details. But first, you got to see this. Looks like burglars are ditching the ski masks. Um, security footage that that is showing a man in a, in a Miami store smashing through a display case and sealing 19 iPhones, $8,000, all while wearing that cardboard box on his head. Now, at one point, you saw that box fell off. He rushes to put it back on. Uh, police took that man in custody shortly after he's facing charges of grand theft, burglary, and criminal mischief. So much for thinking outside the box. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. Let's get you caught up in 30 seconds. Pope Francis is recovering after abdominal surgery today. The Vatican says there were no complications for the 86-year-old pontiff. In Hawaii, the Kilauea volcano is erupting again. It is one of the most active volcanoes in the world. And remember, in 2018, it destroyed 700 homes. And you might have seen the orange sky pictures all over Instagram. Well, smoke from Canada wildfires is making air quality in the Northeast absolutely terrible. In New York City, it is so bad, the air is ranked the worst in the world. And Joran Vandersloot is expected to be extradited to the United States tomorrow. Now, he is facing federal wire fraud and extortion charges here in the United States. And these stem from the disappearance of American teen Natalie Holloway back in 2005. But he was never charged with any crimes for Holloway's disappearance. However, he is currently serving a 28-year prison sentence in Peru for the murder of another woman. NBC's Guad Venegas joins us now from Peru. Guad, uh, his lawyer says that Vandersloot has had a change of heart and does not want to be extradited now. But I, I got to ask, isn't, isn't he right now in what's known as a pretty violent prison that he got beat up in in Peru? He's there for murder. But if he's brought back here to the United States, he'd be facing a, a trial for a, a lesser charge. Why, why fight that extradition? 
that's correct, Gotti. So he's been serving time in, in a prison that's in the Andes at 5,000 meters altitude. They say this is one of the worst places for any prisoner to be in. Now, he has been transferred in the last few days to a detention center north of Lima. Now, what we know is that initially uh, he did want to be extradited, but then something happened in the last few days. Now, according to his attorney, he did uh, speak to members of the Dutch embassy, and after that conversation, uh, Van der Sloot decided he did not want to be extradited to the United States. His attorney says that the process that was done or followed to extradite him or to move forward with the extradition uh, violated Van der Sloot's rights, and that's why the attorney was opposing it. Uh, but as we heard from a judge in Peru just days ago, that extradition is set to take place for him to face those charges uh, in the United States. So we don't know exactly what is it that changed his mind or why he changed his mind and decided he did not want to be extradited to the United States. Perhaps he's just scared to face the American justice system. The people in Peru uh, say that uh, they believe American investigators can question him in ways he's never been questioned and perhaps dig deeper, not just into the charges he's currently facing, but also uh, the disappearance of Natalie Hallway. Gotti. Uh, we certainly don't have prisons at like 15,000 feet. Uh, I, I guess, Quad, when it comes to extortion and, and fraud charges, uh, what did his lawyer say? His lawyer says uh, Van der Sloot is innocent. Um, he does admit that his client has a gambling problem, a gambling addiction, which, according to his attorney, would have influenced the way he behaved when he accepted this money from Natalie Hallway's family. Uh, here's his attorney speaking to NBC News about this. Él reconoce que sí recibió dinero de ellos, pero lo que él dice es de que él nunca los buscó. Ellos le pusieron una trampa. La señora eh, Bert Halloway, que es la madre de la señorita Natalie Halloway, conjuntamente con una periodista de nombre Greta Van Susteren, y eh, ellos fueron los que lo buscaron a Joran Van der Slot y le dijeron este, que le iban a dar 250 mil dólares porque él dijera dónde estaban el, el, los restos, ¿no? los restos óseos de la señorita eh, Natalie Halloway. Now, uh, Gotti, this morning I also had a conversation with Ricardo Flores. He's the father of the woman that was killed by Van der Sloot here in Peru, who told me he does agree uh, that uh, Van der Sloot has a gambling addiction, but he also said he believes he is lying, and he said he's lied throughout the entire process uh, here in Peru as well. Uh, he only admitted uh, to killing Stephanie Flores after he cut a deal for those 28 years, which he still has to serve in Peru. So let's be clear, Gotti, uh, Peru, the government of Peru agreed to this extradition process only because in the agreement it says that he's going to the U.S. to face uh, these charges for fraud and extortion, but he will return to Peru to serve the rest of that 28-year sentence, and it will only be after that that he will be allowed to return to the United States if he ends up serving time for those charges he's going to go face in the U.S., Gotti. Well, we'll see what happens tomorrow. Guad Venegas, thanks so much. And turning now to Iowa, where former Vice President Mike Pence officially kicked off his presidential run today, and he wasted no time going after Trump, who, you might remember, asked Pence to overturn the 2020 presidential election results. Now, today, Pence used what happened on January 6th as the central argument for why he's the man for the job. I believe that anyone who puts themselves over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. And anyone who asks someone else to put them over the Constitution should never be president of the United States again. However, Trump is still the front runner. So in an already packed Republican field, does Pence stand a chance? NBC's Dasha Burns joins us from Iowa to break that down. So, Dasha, uh, Pence seems to be swinging at his old boss. But what what's the actual pitch here? Well, look, Gotti, that was certainly one of the spicier speeches we've heard out of Mike Pence, a much more direct, clear line of attack against his former boss. And that is really the pitch. He is using what could be his biggest liability as potentially one of his assets to make the argument that he is someone who will hold to the values in the Constitution, that he will not waver. And he's making that argument, Gotti, here in Iowa, which is the state that his team believes is the clearest path forward for him. This is where they see the most fertile ground for his brand of that traditional 
faith-based republicanism. Iowa has a large base of evangelical voters. He hopes he can really appeal to those folks. Another big line of attack against the former president he made today was on the issue of abortion, saying that he was, uh, that the former president was retreating on that issue. So this is the place where he believes he can make the best case. He plans to visit all 99 counties, all 71 pizza ranches, which is an Iowa mainstay. He's planning to really lean into the retail politics here because, Gotti, if he can't win Iowa, then that will really blow the momentum out of this campaign. But if he can either win or maybe play second here, then he might have a path forward. So, I mean, sorry if uh, is an oversimplification, but so Pence, but in Iowa and spicy. That's the that's that's the difference. This time. <laughs> yeah. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, taking a step way back uh, and, and looking at what's quickly turning into a very crowded fight for the GOP nomination. So in just the last 24 hours, we've seen former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, uh, the North Dakota's governor, also kicking off campaigns. So, uh, I mean, and forgive me for asking this, I just watched Succession, so you've got, like, the con head still on my mind, but... Um, it, some of this kind of gives Connor Roy vibes, not necessarily anybody in particular, but why do people who don't have a chance at getting into the White House run for president? This is not cheap. This is not easy. Uh, you get no sleep. So uh, I got to ask, wh why, why do we see so many people doing it? Listen, Gotti, the con heads, they really believe, you know? <laughs> you, you gotta believe. And and, that, and that's that's sort of the reality. Look, Pence, his, his wife introduced him today. She said they, they really felt that this was a calling. He also, you know, spent four years in the shadow of Trump, so he has an opportunity now to sort of carve out his own brand. And I think, you know, when I go out and I talk to voters, of course, there are a lot of, of GOP primary voters that are still very much back the former president, but there are those who are looking for an alternative. And so you've got these folks coming out of the woodwork saying, hey, that could be me. They see the field as wide open still. And there are politicos that will say, listen, all that's doing, these, these folks jumping in, is, is helping Trump because it's dividing that, you know, turn the page on Trump part of the party. But there are others who say in these early stages, let them battle it out for the per person who can be the strongest alternative to Trump. And, you know, these early nominating states, states like Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina will really help coal the field. And at some point, if there's enough sort of humility in, in the alternate to Trump part of the party for at some point these candidates to say, hey, let's, let's back down and, and let the person that has the best chance uh, take the reins here, Gotti. I mean, seeing all those faces on the field and knowing that it's not even 2024. Dasha, I will say, if you were covering the, uh, you know, uh, Connor um, campaign trail, I, I think you would have pulled a lot better. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm going to do without succession, Gotti. I'm just, I'm, I'm lost <laughs> here, completely at a loss. Yeah, thanks so much. And, and I'll, actually, if you haven't checked out Jury Duty, that one is amazing and uh, a much needed break after covering politics. <laughs> <laughs> I'll need it. Thanks, Scotty. And coming up, a flooding crisis in Ukraine. Thousands there are frantically leaving their homes before they could literally be washed away. We've got an update on that destroyed dam when we come back. So stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. Let's check the headlines around the world right now. In Ukraine, cities are in shambles after a major dam was destroyed yesterday in a Russian-controlled territory. Now, Russian-controlled media says that a state of emergency has been imposed in parts of southern Ukraine, where they say over 2,500 homes have been flooded so far. Now, Ukraine and Russia are continuing to blame one another for the explosion that destroyed that bridge. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken made his first bilateral visit to Saudi Arabia today where he met with the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The spokesperson for Blinken says they talked about security in the Middle East and ending the war in Yemen. Now, this visit comes almost a year after President Biden met with the Crown Prince and claims to have questioned him about the murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The Saudi prince maintained he played no part in that crime despite U.S. intelligence suggesting otherwise. 
and engine problems forced an Air India flight on its way to the United States to make an emergency landing in Russia yesterday, leaving hundreds of people stranded in a country that is right now in the middle of a war. Now, a replacement plane has been called out to pull those passengers out, but it is not expected to arrive until tomorrow. And in Canada, ferocious wildfires continue to rage on, causing all kinds of problems across the continent. There are over 400 active fires right now, and more than half are considered to be burning out of control. They have burned more than 9 million acres, which federal officials there say is 15 times the 10-year average. And four years ago, much of the world watched with bated breath as the famed Notre Dame Cathedral burned to the ground. And today, rebuilding efforts at the iconic Paris Cathedral are moving right along. But are they going to be done in time for next year's Summer Olympics, which are set to kick off in Paris a little more than a year from now? NBC's Keir Simmons has more from the City of Light. Known as the heart of Paris, Notre Dame, French for Our Lady, will be part of the city's stunning setting during next year's Olympics. The scars from the fire are still visible this morning, but the resurrection of this religious icon is well underway. The blaze back in April 2019 was devastating, destroying her famous ceiling, tearing through the interior of the church and spectacularly toppling the spire. Oh, my God, this people just fell inside the church. Oh, my God. Since that day, the task of reconstruction has been colossal. Stone, wood, paint and glass. In this workshop, they are rebuilding parts of the ceiling, relearning techniques used by the original craftsmen centuries ago. It's the way it was done in the medieval times. Among them, Peter Henriksen, a carpenter from Minnesota who is here to lend his skills through a non-profit organization. Good. 5-2. Being a part of this is, is really amazing. Thinking about what carpenters were thinking about when they were originally doing it. Just a year before the fire, the Today Show got an exclusive tour of the cathedral. Are we going to run into Quasimodo? Ah, it's possible. <laughs> Michelle Picot, who leads fundraising efforts in the US, showed me around back then, up to the bell tower. Among the ancient rafters and inside the spire, it would soon become a raging inferno. And this is what the inside of the cathedral looks like now. The race to restore her, a marathon. This week, I met Michelle Picard again, who says they can see the finishing line, though the inside will not be complete before the games. Will she look the way she did? Maybe she, better. She will look better. So the spire will be uh, rebuilt this year, and the roof will be rebuilt in 2024. So when the Olympics will uh, happen, you will see the cathedral from the exterior, I would say more or less as it was before the fire. Also returning to their home on top of the cathedral will be these 16 statues made of copper, now on display in the Paris Museum of Architecture. Incredibly, just four days before the fire, they were removed for some TLC, a lucky escape. It was a miracle, really. Yeah. Maybe the hand yeah. of God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was a, a real miracle, because if they were not removed, uh, we... They wouldn't we, be here. No. And while the cathedral won't be open by next summer, down in the ancient crypt, visitors can experience Notre Dame through virtual reality. Wow, now I'm right at the entrance, but not in 2023, but 800 years ago. So real. <laughs> this immersive 3D marvel is the closest visitors to the games will come to the real thing and to the Olympic effort now underway to return it to the people of Paris. Now, they are hoping that Notre Dame is finished in time for the Olympics on the outside. But as I mentioned, inside, well, you won't be able to go inside next summer when the Games are on here in Paris. It is a huge task, costing so far more than $200 million. Still will be a sight to behold. Keir Simmons, thanks so much. And before we go, it is time for the future of everything. We keep telling you about how AI is popping up in just about every industry. So uh, it would make sense for lawmakers to be calling for regulations, right? But what would that look like? Well, Congressman Don Beyer is here next with his take.
So the future of AI regulation, we really don't know when or if lawmakers will act. In fact, there are members of Congress who are still learning about how AI even works. I, I think what we want to do is bring in the experts and make sure that we're all singing from the same sheet of music as to Can we just ask you why you think it's important for the Senate and Congress in general to receive these types of briefings? Well, I think it's important because we, nobody here really knows very much about it to begin with. We're just scratching the surface of this issue, which is literally uh, has the capacity to change America. Uh, there's hardly a committee of jurisdiction that can't find some angle or some hook when it comes to artificial intelligence. Certainly the warning about an existential threat, even if it sounds exaggerated, is credible from members of the industry who help to form AI and spread it. Well, I think everybody's concerned about AI. The issue is what, if any, uh, role does the government have to play here? Now, there is some hope. There is some movement on Capitol Hill. By our count, there are at least six current proposals in Congress that have something to do with governing AI in the title of the bill. Four are in the House, two are in the Senate. None have passed either chamber. Now, those federal proposals do not include cities and states around the country that have already passed laws and ordinances addressing things like AI bias and privacy. But joining us now from our D.C. Bureau is Congressman Don Beyer from Virginia. Welcome, Congressman. I guess first off, I, I don't know. Should we start with the nitty gritty on, on the policy that you were proposing or, or should we go big picture existential question first? Your call. Well, I, I, let's go big picture. I think the existential okay. is the most interesting and the most positive, so it, too. All right. So jumping straight into the, the, the Skynet conversation, do you think <laughs> AI could lead to the end of the human race? <laughs> I don't think so. And when you get a lot of people talking about the existential threats, no one's really been able to define them. You know, they just think, well, what happens when machines are so intelligent? Um, but as, as we hear from the experts, the machines will never learn how to think. They'll pick up patterns from things that we humans have already generated. And the potential for good things to happen, all the breakthroughs in science and medicine, in how the, our, our, our systems work, from everything from how business works to supply chains, it'll be a different and much better world when AI fully kicks in. I, I desperately want to believe everything you're saying. Uh, not sure if I agree with it, but I, I do want to believe with it. So, so let's, um, let's start with the bills you are co-sponsoring right now in the House that specifically mention AI. Uh, what do you think the priority should be right now? Well, the most existential threat is the one that you and I have lived under all of our lives, which is nuclear weapons. We know nuclear weapons can end life on this planet. So there's a good bill with uh, two congressmen, one Democrat, one Republican, um, that would say no AI in the chain of making the decision to launch nuclear weapons. Um, but then there are things that are a little more um, well, closer to home, like making sure that if you have AI-generated advertising, there's a disclosure that was generated by AI, or some privacy concerns. Uh, one of the biggest things is trying to make sure that um, there's explainability within AI. If AI recommends that you, Gotti, should do something, can it also show, can you show us their, your, its work? How did mm -hmm. it come to make that decision? And so to keep humans in the loop at all times when it comes to a lot of the things like, like nuclear, when it comes to defense, are, are you at all worried about the integration of AI and uh, some of the things our military does or some of the things adversarial countries might be uh, implementing? Well, I think that does make sure that, that we continue to build a, a superior lead on AI in our country. Uh, all the intelligence experts I know make sure that we want to be out front so we're not you know, taken advantage of. But let's face it, if you look at the way civil war was fought or World War I and the way we fight wars right now, already technology has had an enormous influence. And it's naive to think it won't continue to have an ever bigger influence in the years to come. And Congressman, you saw the regulators, U.S. regulators, uh, FTC, DOD, a lot of them are coming out and they're basically saying they already have the power to go to after AI to, to try to, I guess, curtail some of the harm and they're already using it. Uh, do, do you think that that's enough to kind of keep things at bay or, or do we need uh, stricter laws going forward in almost every sector uh, where technology comes into play? 
I think that, I, I don't know if stricter is the right world, but word, but yes, we're going to need ever more legislation. Um, but we're doing it little by little. You mentioned the six bills. There will probably be 12 or 20 by the end of this year. But they'll be piecewise. If we try to do something too comprehensive out of the box, we're really going to mess it up. In the meantime, you know, folks like the Federal Trade Commission think they have all the tools they need right now to manage F AI within the FTC context. It sounds like job security for you. Maybe not for me. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> we'll not. see. Maybe not. Thanks so much, Congressman. Okay, thank you, Gotti. And while regulators figure out how to stop the, the harmful potential of AI, there is still plenty of good already happening from the technology. Turns out artificial intelligence is hard at work on the farm. Jake Ward has that story. Okay, yes, it's a killer robot with an AI brain. But hear me out. It kills weeds. On a 2,000-acre organic farm in Central California, this $1.2 million machine does the work of 30 people 24 hours a day. The machine is, is thinking. It's learning. It's understanding what it's seeing. What AI is great at is telling the difference between things. In this case, the difference between chard and a weed and then killing the weeds with lasers. CEO Paul Mikesell has invented a system that fries weeds too small for a human hand to grab in bursts that last only milliseconds. The field smells like burnt popcorn. The whole trick here is the lasers disrupt the cellular cycle within the plant with heat energy. It takes a rack okay. of servers to recognize 40 crops and 80 oh, types of weeds. This machine has got more computing power than 24 Teslas in it. It's essentially a mobile data center. Mm. The farm's owner says the laser weeder will pay for itself in a single year and that it solves his single biggest problem, which is finding workers. We're just not getting the influx of new folks that want to come in to this deal. Now, in a job like behind us on this tractor where someone could be making, you know, a really good wage, $30 an hour, he's got a laptop, that's a little easier to find that person. Labor unions say they want tech to make the work easier as long as we don't simply toss people aside after decades of brutal labor. To the extent that automation can make life better for farm workers by making those jobs less physically demanding, safer, more dignified, we welcome it. Our concern is that automation will allow employers to basically uh, discard them. <laughs> AI is spreading oh, through farming. There's the broccoli bot built by Oregon college students to harvest the vegetable. And John Deere has been plowing ahead with several kinds of AI technology. For Paul Mikesell, it's about more than just zapping weeds. The data that comes out of these images will be incredibly valuable for farmers to be able to predict what's going to happen in the future based on past action. So you're because not just killing weeds, but, right. but actually harvesting data that we can yeah. use to make crops better. Yeah, that's right. If you talk to any farmer, they'll tell you it's not a, just about the data, but about the insight that you can get from the data. Mm. Mike Zell expects AI will allow robots to work in fields and factories in entirely new ways. The capabilities are too great, and the wave is only starting right now. Jake Ward, NBC News, Soledad, California. That does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you tomorrow, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.